Vibe. Vibe. A simple, brave with action that with came out of frustration. Humanity. Making the world a better place. Humanity. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Vibe with Humanity podcast. I'm very excited for today's guest. We have Gavin from the Wake Up Call in Sacramento, 106.5 The End. He's been running since 2007. And if you tune in in the morning, you're going to feel better than before you started the show. So. <laughs> I hope so. We just, just got an email um, from a girl who literally said that we saved her life. I mean, talk about somebody who lose, she lost everything and she lost everything in a super short amount of time. And, and none of it was her fault. And none of it was her. In fact, if anything, it's because she loved people too much and got too close to them. Mm. And, uh, and she was talking about, she said something in the email that made a lot of sense to me where she was like, I couldn't even listen to music anymore. And I remember feeling like that mm. after my daughter died, um, my wife really went through that and she's like, and, uh, I would listen to you guys only when you talked and I would turn the music off and she's like, and little by little, I would listen to more and more. And she's like, and you guys got me laughing again. And it's like, yeah, we totally lose sight of that. Why do you think she couldn't listen to music and how could you relate to that? Like one thing my wife said, and it actually made me laugh when she said it, but um, she, she, one of the reasons why she said she couldn't listen to music after our daughter Phoebe died was because she was thinking, what did they have to be so happy about? Hmm. And it was making her really angry to know that other people didn't have to deal with what we were dealing with. And it made all the sense in the world. And I'll bet a lot of people kind of have those thoughts. Yeah. Did you see that coming? Like, did you know it was a potential that? No. Oh, so, um, gosh. so the, okay. So what happened to us, I'll tell the story. Sure. So my wife was pregnant with our second child, which who was, uh, um, a little girl named Phoebe mm -hmm. and she was perfect the whole pregnancy. Like our doctor was, would always make a joke at the checkups and she's reading the textbook in there, like on size, on development, like everything was textbook. She had a heartbeat that was so strong that you could hear it on the Doppler. I think it's called a Doppler before you even dropped it to, to my wife's stomach. You could hear it. It got picked up. So we go in for an appointment at, um, 40 weeks cause she's full term and my wife isn't ready to have the baby yet. And, um, but she's 40 weeks and our son was late too. So we didn't think anything of it. And the, you know, we had a great appointment and, um, doctors like, okay, so I mean, I guess we need to start having a conversation about, well, you know, do we want to induce or do we just want to wait? And he's like, I think we should at least talk about a date for, for inducing. So why don't you guys come back, um, in a couple days and, and, you know, we'll, we'll have that discussion then. And we're like, okay, cool. So we made an appointment five days later. And then five days later we went back and my wife, she laid down and my wife didn't tell me this at the time, but she was already nervous going mm. into that appointment because Phoebe was super active, like just always moving. And in that last day or so, um, my wife didn't feel her moving at all. Mm. And she didn't tell me any of this because my wife thought, well, she's over 40 weeks now and she's already big. She's, you know, going to be eight and a half, nine pound baby. She's probably out of room. Mm. So she didn't, she tried to like calm herself down that way. So we went and we laid down and me and the doctor are joking around like we did every single appointment. And then he got out the heart Doppler and then he lowered it to her and we heard nothing. And, um, I wasn't nervous, but my wife started to get nervous immediately and he was just moving it around and like every second was a minute and I could see on his face that he was getting more and more concerned. Mm. And finally we hear a heartbeat and everybody in the room was like, Oh my God, thank God. What was that about? And then he was, he said, hold on one second. And then he did it again and he picked up my wife's wrist and what we were hearing was my wife's heartbeat mm. because she, her heart was beating so strong and, and fast. It was picking it up all the way in the bit. womb. Yeah. Wow. He then sent us to get an ultrasound and then it was confirmed that she had died somewhere between 40 weeks and 40 weeks and five days. She passed away. So not only did we have the trauma of, um, 
of losing her after 40 weeks and having a stillborn, but we also had PTSD because it was a sudden event. We've talked to people who've lost kids through um, diseases and stuff like that, and they get this. These aren't my words. This is uh, one mother said this to me that she had an on ramp to that grief mm -hmm. versus a sudden car crash. And so we had a lot to work out with with um, that, not just the trauma of losing a kid, but then how to get over the PTSD of it. And that's where we learned about something called EMDR. Do you know what EMDR is? Um, yeah, it's a trauma treatment method. Is that yeah. the tapping yes. or the elect? It's okay. crazy. It like, worked. It worked. Huh? It's amazing. And it like, there's something about the 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 sensations in the hands that you because you hold paddles. You know, and, and um, if I remember it right, they vibrated or something, and then you have to relive that trauma, and that sucks. It That's does not suck. easy. Yeah. yeah, but there's something with the while you're reliving it with the vibrations in your hand, and it, it takes it out of the short term memory and puts it in the long term memory hmm. in your brain, and it works. Yeah, you have to do more than one session, but it works. It's crazy. How long did you experience trauma before you did the treatment, and what were your biggest trauma symptoms? The biggest symptoms that I had were. Well, there were two right afterwards. It was seeing other babies. That was awful. Oh, yeah. That was terrible. And then the other one that I had, because we got pregnant a year later, um, almost, a, almost a year later to the day we had, um, our rainbow baby, our son, Theo, who is amazing. He's like literally born, I think three, yeah, three days after Phoebe would have been one. So, um, like he was a total blessing, but then I got trauma all over again because he was a boy and we lost a girl and I wasn't prepared for that at all. And it wasn't, it's something that I don't expect people to understand, but people who have been in that situation, they get it. But like, you're super happy that you have a baby. Mm hmm and then there's this other part of you that still feels incomplete because it wasn't it wasn't the gender that you lost hmm. like because when you find out that you're going to have a boy or a girl oh, you know wow. you project a whole life i hadn't thought the, about the that the second you find out that you know you're going to have a girl you can picture a nursery that's going to be pink and you can picture father daughter dances and you can picture you know dancing with her at her wedding you can picture all these things and then you lose her and that's all gone. It's like somebody highlighted and deleted that entire life that you spent months projecting. And then you have boy and you're super happy and you project all of that, but it's not what was deleted. That was really hard to deal with. So how you already done trauma treatment in that year before he was born and this mm -hmm. reflared it. Yeah. And wow. it, but it was totally different. It was all, it was all different. And then having, you know, uh, people around you have girls and, and stuff like that. It just re-triggered everything. Yeah. That's tough. I, <laughs> I struggled with, um, like looking at kids that aren't cared for, looking at parents that take their kids for granted. Yeah. And I'm like, mine got cancer and you don't even, you know, that used yep. to, that was really tough for me yep. for a long time. So I get that, you know, when you see other kids and it's a weird feeling, it's a mix of anger and sadness and resentment and then like confusion like how do you not take how do you not realize it's incredible that there's just nothing wrong with your kid right you know you're in a a job in a role where you have to be on and mm -hmm. you have to have you know your spark you have to be like like when we're people have those days where they're just humming and they're just on and they're the life of the party right. you basically have to elicit that every day yeah how did this impact that oh hugely i'm sure oh my god what was that like so you know, obviously with the, with the morning radio show, we had to, um, tell the audience the, you know, that we were pregnant and we, and the whole time that we were doing, um, the pregnancy that, you know, we were giving updates and having funny stories and stuff like that. So listeners were going along on the journey oh, and that wasn't just us. Yeah. That's, that's, if you're a good broadcaster, if you're a good, especially morning radio show host, you should let listeners in on your life and they should be part of it and stuff like that. So you know, so Phoebe died and the show did not go on the next day. Mm -hmm. And listeners knew that, um, we were close to having her and they were getting 
some of them were getting suspicious as to like, did something happen? And then at the time we had a different co-host, but Katie was on the show and we made the decision like, well, we have to tell, we have to say what happened. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and they said, do you want us to say? And I said, no, I said, I, I don't think you guys should. I, th I think it should be me. Wow. And then my wife, and this really impressed me because she's super introverted. She said, I want to go with you. I want to tell everybody too. Wow. So we went on, I think four days after she died and we, and we were grateful for our company for obviously for understanding, but they allowed us to do whatever we wanted. And we were on for like an hour and 15 minutes or an hour and 30 minutes. We didn't play any music. We didn't play any commercials. And um, we told the story of what happened. And then uh, it was just listener after listener calling with condolences or wow. um, or similar stories. So you felt love. Mm -hmm. That's and, amazing. And then um, and that did feel that was the first time we felt good after we lost her was leaving. But then the second we got home, it was bad. Like, cause then you're just let, that was actually something to do. But going back to that empty house is just terrible. It's so hard. And then we had our nursery already too. So like, you're just reminded of everything. So when I was in the hospital though, right after we lost her, I called Katie, my co-host, and I was crying on the phone. And I asked her to come by and she came by the hospital and we were sitting outside the cafeteria and I told her, I was like, I'm worried I'm never going to be funny again. I forget what she said, but she, she, I mean, she said you will be essentially you will be, but I definitely had that thought though at the time, like there's no coming back from this. And was that not only will I not be funny, but I'll never feel even joy again. Oh, like, definitely. Yeah. I remember thinking, how can anybody, I remember thinking, how can anybody, all I wanted to do was talk to somebody who also had a stillborn mm. after we had it, because I had the thought, how can anybody know what this is like and not have killed themselves? Mm. Like, is there anybody still alive that has felt this pain? And, and then you find out, there's millions. Yeah, there's tons of people. Did you get have. connected with any mm -hmm. of them? Wow. Yeah, there's a there was a group that they were told us about while we were still in the hospital called Sharing Parents. That uh, they're not therapists, but they're all people who have had stillborns. <laughs> and the best yeah. resource. And I yeah. and I called and I'll never forget her, but her name was Sharon Cox, and she called me back and she and I had a phone call. My wife wasn't ready to talk to anybody, but I went outside in the hospital and had a conversation and. Um, and just knowing that this had happened to her and she sounded like a fine, normal, adjusted person. It's like, okay, so maybe one day we'll be okay. At that moment though, like I was like, no, no one has gone through this suffering and, and made it. How long did you feel that bad? Like in, in that particular mindset, I'll never be funny again. There's no joy. Nobody's gone through this. I can't relate. It's never going to wear off. Yeah. How long was that? That was probably like, for me, that was probably like two weeks oh of that's that. a long time my wife it was that. longer oh my god it was longer for my wife thankfully we had we had a son um mm. that in the lost community they call like your sunshine baby um because it's like the only thing that like gives you warmth at the time um but i think at the end of it though you can't not only did i come out of it i think fine as far as like, yeah. can, how can anybody be fine after this? But um, I think I came out of it a better person. That that was a question I had for you. So this had to create a paradigm shift in how mm -hmm. you view the world, how you oh, view yeah. other people, how you view what's important. How do I want to spend? How do you want to spend your time? I know for me, stuff that I used to get stressed about that seemed like big problems were laughable, yeah. and then the smaller things that seemed like they weren't worth spending time on, little reading a story or just stopping and looking at the graphs became the most important things I can do. And then I had this desire to try to do something that helps as many people as I can. And I know you started a foundation, you're really big mm -hmm. into propping up local artists. How did this shift your perspective? In so I, uh, I don't know if I invented this term or not. I'm, I'll, I'll take credit for it. Sure. Okay. I invented it. It's all I'm, yours. I'm sure I We're didn't, not fact checking though. here. I'm <laughs> sure I did. But, um, I, I started saying that I feel like I have post-traumatic growth 
and it was after like what happened, it does, sh it shifts everything in your life. Like the, you'll hear people say the phrase, like, this is your new normal. You'll hear that all the time. And your new normal at first, when you hear it is terrifying and super sad and depressing and scary. It doesn't have to be because it's just like your life. And now it has shifted in a completely different direction. And that doesn't mean that it's going to take you in a worse direction, but also the empathy that I have for people now yes. is off the charts. Yes. I, I feel, I feel so much worse, you know, or, or, or want to help people. Whereas before I didn't, I find myself doing stuff, especially in the lost community. Like it, there's been multiple times. What's the, Oh, lost. Lo yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, for people who've lost yes. kids, there've been multiple times where, um, people have lost kids or had stillborns. I'll move heaven and earth for those people. Like I've gone to the hospital while they're still in the hospital. If like a relative gets in touch with me and I'll go because I remember how much I just wanted to talk to somebody oh, wow. who had been through this and I'll go and I'll sit in a room with strangers and, and hug them and cry and let them know like, you're going to be okay. This is, it's going to be okay. It doesn't seem like it right now, but you will be, it, you can be, you know, that's a lot of good that's come from this. What, what else, what good came from this event? I think, well, I think another really weird side effect was, cause I've seen it go the other way too, is, um, is I kind of found spirituality and religion okay. because the day we found out that she died, um, we were driving home from the hospital and we passed a, there's a church that was right by our house at the time. And we had never been in that church or anything like it. And I said, and L oh, and my wife and I also were, we weren't atheists, but we were more agnostic. Like we don't know, nobody knows. And we don't really care. Yeah. That was like our philosophy. And for some reason after that, I said, I want to go to that church and I just want to pray. And I want to pray that maybe the doctor was wrong and the equipment was wrong and, and hold out hope that that's what happened. And my wife went with me and we went in and it was empty except for, um, the guy who, who runs it. Um, and his, his name's father cliff and we had never met him before. And we told him what happened and we were like, can we just, can we just pray? We're not even sure if we know how to do it. Can we, can we just pray? And he goes, yeah, absolutely. He goes, go into the chapel. And we did after like 30 minutes or so, he came in and sat with us and we found out that the exact same thing happened to him. Oh my gosh. It was, and it, and it was Whoa. weird. And not only that, but he also said, um, and remember he's a stranger <laughs> Yeah. and he said, I mean, I'm, supposed to leave for vacation tomorrow. He goes, uh, cause we hadn't even delivered her. She was still inside of my wife. He goes, um, I'm supposed to leave for vacation tomorrow. He goes, but I'm not going far. I'm just going up to Tahoe. And he said, if here's my number, if you need me for anything, call me. He's like, I'll come back. And he did. Hmm. He came back and he posthumously baptized her. And, um, and he was one of very few people who got to hold Phoebe. And he just said everything right. Like if there was, if we would have gone into a church that was completely against our, our ideology and what we believe, or if he was a church leader that did come and did come into the hospital and baptize her or whatever, and, and was trying to help us and said the wrong thing. Like everything happens for a reason, mm. you know, God has a reason for everything. If he, they would have said that it would have completely turned us off again. We would have gone the exact opposite, but he didn't, he said everything right. Like, mm. and he, and he was, I remember he was standing there holding Phoebe and we said, why would God allow this to do to happen? Like, why did this happen? What's the reason? And he was like, there's no reason. We don't understand God, you know, we don't, we don't understand it. And he said, you know, the, the universe is chaos. He goes, and that is really scary. It's easier 
to believe sometimes for some people that they do happen for a reason, then there was no reason. And I get that. I can yeah. understand why people want to believe that things happen for a reason. I feel like if you're somebody that believes that everything happens for a reason, I, I'm not sure if you have really had trauma and suffering, I'm not sure how that has helped you. I never thought about that. I never did either until I had that conversation with him. And because of that, not only, not only was all that right, but then obviously because of what he did for us, we attended a church service, our first church service in years. And, and everything about the ideology of the church was pitch perfect. You know, that all they, all they preached was acceptance and love and really focused on, on, you know, how that was Jesus's thing. That was his vibe. It was, it was just, it was such a perfect series of events. And it made me think like, this can't be a coincidence. No way. This, this not a can't chance. be a coincidence. No way. Like I, I, and again, I'm not saying that things happen for a reason. I think that things happened and then we were just more in tune to pay attention to be where God, Jesus, whatever wanted us to be. Hmm. And I think that's, that was another positive thing that came out of it. That's absolutely beautiful. Yeah. What do you, when people are going through something like what you're going through, I, I know when I went through it, everybody reached out and what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? And that was very hard. It's, it's an yeah. amazing gesture. It was beautiful. And we felt the love, but it also put a task on our plate. <laughs> right. And then the times that people would reach out and just talk, like my buddy would just call me and talk about like things that we used to talk about before this happened. And it was so, it was a break from the whole thing. Yeah. What would you say to listeners and people who like, how can people support yeah. someone else going through something so like this? What are the do's and don'ts? When you lose a kid, mm -hmm. there's really nothing to do. Mm. And that sucks because there's so many people that are like, you know, well, what can, what can we do? And people were bringing meals over and stuff like that. And it's like, I appreciate the effort. We have a lot of time now. It's the opposite. It's not like we have to go to hospital appointments and doctor's appointments and this, that, or the other thing, it's the opposite. It's that we have nothing to fill our time. We were prepared to be in newborn life, which gives you no downtime. Mm -hmm. And now we have nothing but downtime. And that means there's a lot of time to sit with your thoughts, which is hard. Fair like, hard. um, so when people were like, you know, well, what can we do? Our answer was always like, um, I mean, just come over and sit with us. Mm. And I, and at first people do that, but then I think after a while it's too much, it's too heavy for people, you know, like it's, if, if like, if you've ever been around somebody who finds out the moment that they've lost their child, they make, they scream and it's a noise you'll never forget. And they don't make it just that one time. Mm. They make it for months off and on. And People don't want to hear that. And I understand that it's that's, that's something you can't get out of your head. Mm -hmm. Like I can still hear the sound of my wife screaming. It's terrible. It's terrible. So like, I can understand why people don't want to come over and be around that. Um, so like sometimes just come over and like, I don't know, do the dishes for them. Yeah. Or like, one thing that was really great was my wife had a, a friend who just every day would send her some kind of text. If it was just a heart emoji mm. or if it was just anything. And it was just a reminder that like, just be present in whatever way they need. Like, and, and I'm not saying to ask them cause that was a great point. Like right. now you're putting it on them, <laughs> you know, like they're going through a lot. Just do something, mm -hmm. you know? figure out on your own, what do they need? And my wife's friend figured out she needs to be alone, but still feel tethered to somebody that she knows that yeah. through a text message, a and daily so text message, yeah. whatever you need, I am there. You know, even if I don't have to say whatever you need, or do you need something just know, like, didn't forget. 
Yeah. Thanks for sharing all that. Oh, that's, of course. That's and, and and sometimes like if you're somebody that is going through, if you're the one suffering, you have to take a step back from friendships. Mm. Like, and you have to put a pot, like they're really good friends of ours and we're, we're friends with them again, but they're really good friends of ours though, that like we had to stop being friends with. For what reason? Um, in, in some situations they had a baby. Oh, triggering. Right. Yeah. Uh, okay. in other situations they just weren't good at, um, like making us feel normal. Like, um, they either would talk to us like we were some sort of like charity case or in other cases, like they would just, whether they were, they did it. I don't think they, anybody did it maliciously, but they would just say things like, you know, I think it's time for you to like get over it. Or I think it's time oh. for you to like move on. Or have you thought about moving on? Or have you thought about the, and it's like, you don't get to dictate my timeline. No, and yes, I've thought about it. <laughs> right. Of course I've thought about it. <laughs> right, yeah. Wow. Yeah, unfortunately, this is common, and so are miscarriages, which, mm -hmm. especially for women, that's hard for men to relate to. They're losing a life for themselves totally. as well. It's kind of similar, but a lot of people are suffering with pretty much the worst thing you can face in humanity, the sudden loss of an mm -hmm. offspring. Mm -hmm. What message do you have for them? There are lots of people out there. And, and there are communities, you know, that can help you. And I know that it's, it's super dark, you know, but you can, you can find people that will help you. Mm. And the sooner you get that help, the better. Like I remember we would go and have, there were a couple families that we met that lost right around the same time that we do. And they weren't working and we weren't working obviously. And we would, we didn't want to see anybody except for families of loss for months that they were the only people that we wanted to see because mm -hmm. they understood it, mm -hmm. whether they lost recently or whether they lost years ago. And we would get lunch with them. And that would be the highlight of the week is just knowing like, okay, well, we're going to go see them. We're going to go to this restaurant and we're going to sit and talk and, um, you know, talk about the loss, not talk about the loss. It doesn't matter, you know? And, um, you can find people like that. They are, they are strangers, but eventually you'll connect with them, find support groups. And I mean, sharing parents, their website, sharingparents.org. Mm. They're a great organization. That's a really good to get out there. Mm -hmm. So do not isolate. Find Don't other isolate. People. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Don't yeah. isolate. That's, that's a better way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, no, you, you, unless you it. want to, unless that feels right. That's the other part too. Like for my wife, isolating felt right to her for a while. Um, for me, it wasn't, yeah, you know, same. the only person she wanted to be around was me and, and our son. Mm. And it was like that for months and months. Wow. Yeah. How's she doing now? She's fine now. That's yeah. Great, she's yeah. great. And we've, we've had, um, oh, I talked about our, our son, our rainbow baby, rainbow babies, the other expression, sunshine baby or rainbow baby. And the rainbow, the rainbow babies are babies you have after a loss because oh. the rainbow comes after the storm. So that's why they, they, I love that. I know. I've I never heard too. either of those. So we had a boy and then we did eventually have a girl as well. Wow. So, um, yeah, Theo and Zoe. Wow, man. Congrats. Yeah. I'm happy to hear that. How do you think? Did, how did this impact the way you view humanity as a whole and that the way you interact with people on an individual level? I think it, it, it affected it mostly positive, mm. but then there are times though, where I get really mad at humanity too, like as a whole, because we just squabble over like bullshit, like seeing, um, a couple, I'm guessing they were first time parents. Mm -hmm in Bye Bye Baby back when that was still open. And they were having this like passionate argument about what kind of stroller to get. And I remember thinking like, who cares? Like, this doesn't matter. Like I wanted to interrupt them and tell them my story mm -hmm. and be like, you guys just need to be happy you're having a baby. You know, like what, who, the brand of the stroller matters zero. And putting any emotion to that matters even less. It's exactly. actually, yeah, exactly. No, I, I get that. Do, do you feel like it made you kinder towards people? Oh, like, on, like when you're getting coffees and like when you're just running around through town or maybe yep. even your listeners, did, did it impact you that way? Yeah. I, I mean, besides like helping people that are lost just everyday kindness. Yeah. Totally. Mm -hmm. Like 
Um, it's important. It's yeah, kind of the most I'm important pretty, thing. I'm a super impatient person, mm-hmm. and I am quick to anger, but like it used to be worse. And um, yeah, I think that I do have a, like, a lot more patience waiting in line, or especially with kids. Mm. I have so much empathy for, for kids now. Like a screaming kid in a restaurant or a plane doesn't bother me. Yeah. <laughs> not, not at all. That's you know, awesome. and the people who do get really bothered by it, it's always like, mm, act like a grown up. You're mm-hmm. okay. <laughs> like yeah. that kid's screaming because his ears are popping and he thinks his head's about yeah. to explode. Or he doesn't least... get it. You get it. You're 40. He's not. No you kidding. Know? You Calm need down. to grow up. <laughs> right. <laughs> Stop crying. <laughs> this is on you for not bringing yeah. noise canceling headphones. Oh, you know? That's good. Do you have a story, mission, purpose, or company trying to help people and you need a platform to get your message out? Hit me up on Instagram, Vibe with Humanity. Thanks for watching, guys.